Okay, we're ready to go, and we're glad you're here in person, and uh, got the thumbs up that uh, those online have joined us. We're glad uh, you're here uh, for a, a good occasion, but it's always kind of sad in a way when we see our summer series come to an end, and tonight's the last night of our summer series. Uh, we have uh, Harley Davidson with us uh, from Western Hills in, in Lawton. Uh, he's been with us every year for uh, quite a few years, and uh, it's it's good to have him. He just celebrated his 30th anniversary there at Western Hills, and uh, we're we're happy uh, for him, and uh, glad to have him here tonight. I would tell you what he's speaking on, but he told me he changed his title, so I don't know what he's talking about tonight. Uh, but he's going to help us move forward. That, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's the important thing. Again, as we are looking at this year in just different ways uh, to help us move forward individually and as a church family. So it's good to have Harley here tonight. Before Harley speaks to us, uh, Mike is going to lead us in, in a couple songs. Jeremy Kane is going to lead us in a prayer. And after the prayer, Harley, it's it's yours. And good evening. Living by faith. I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth o'er everything, and all of my worry is fame. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in his great love. From all harm sake, in his sheltering arm, I'm living by faith and feel no alarm. Though tempests may blow and the storm clouds arise, obscuring the brightness of life. I'm never alarmed at the overcast skies. The master looks on at the strife. Living by faith in Jesus above. Trusting, confiding in his great love. From all harm safe in his sheltering arms. I'm living by faith and feel no alarm. Our Lord will return to this earth some sweet day. Our troubles will then all be o'er. The Master so gently will lead us away beyond that blessed heavenly shore. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in his great love. From all harm safe in his sheltering arm, I'm living by faith and feel no The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope. 
The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. Therefore I will hope in him. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, we thank you for this midweek service, to this opportunity to come together and, and be reminded that we, uh, we have company on this road we walk, uh, this, this path to you. Father, we thank you that uh, you've provided uh, this church to, to be that, uh, provide those companions and to, to know that um, we're in this together. Father, we thank you for uh, your steadfast love, and we thank you for your faithfulness, and uh, as uh, Harley brings this lesson tonight, please bless him to um, provide the words we need to hear in this moment and th this evening, and and uh, help us to take what he says and, and uh, follow you all the more truly with it. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. Church, Amen. it's good to see you tonight. It's always good to be here. God has been good to us this summer. How about you? Can I hear an amen on this side over here? We are an amen church, are we not? Uh, you know, I've probably told you this. We've been, uh, I've been coming here for like 30 years. Actually, before it was Chisholm Trail, you know, the other churches and things and all of the things there. And I remember going one time to a church, uh, actually, and I asked, um, I had never been there before. People seemed to be nice. They were my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I asked the question, is this an amen church? Give me an amen. Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> I knew we were in for a ride that night. It was good. But uh, before, before I left, though, I heard three or four of them. And one little lady, I'll never forget, she was probably as old as I am now, but she, she, she simply said, she said, I really like that you did that because she said it felt like we were alive again. I want to talk to you tonight about, um, <laughs> Leonard kind of teased with that because I, I really had forgotten what message I told him because he invites me every year to come and I forgot what it was I was going to teach on. And so I said, well, I know it's the last one and I thought what I'd do tonight is I would come here to just encourage you because we all need it, all of us. Did you, did, you ever, um, did you ever find some money, you ever be cleaning your car out, and you go in there, and you look down, and there's some coins? It makes you feel pretty good. Anybody out there besides me? Yeah, it's really good. Sometimes you can find quarters, dimes, nickels, whatever the case is. Most of the time, there's pennies for mine, and they're usually got some gummy stuff on there. You've ever been there and did that? But, but it really makes you feel good when you find something. In the couch cushion, you might find enough to buy a soda or a candy bar or something like that. And you suck up a few in the uh, vacuum cleaner. You ever do that? Did you ever go into the vacuum cleaner and get those coins out? Aha, uh -huh, you're telling on yourself. Well, I kid you not, it wasn't too long ago I, I got a sport coat. I don't really, I like to wear vests and not sport coats. And so, but I put on a sport coat one Sunday and I reached in my pocket. I thought it was a note. And I kid you not, and when I pulled that out, I pulled out one, two, three, $100 bills. I was like, yes, this is going to be a great Sunday. I'm here to tell you. And you know exactly what I did next, don't you? Somebody go ahead and tell me. What did I do next? Gave it to my wife, somebody said. No, I checked every suit coat I had, every pair of pants I had. I checked even the dryer lint thing, you know what I'm saying? I wanted to see if there's something, and I didn't find anything else. So we get encouraged by certain things in our lives, and that's one thing that certainly encouraged me. A poor rancher in West Texas named Ira Yates he became a multi-multi-millionaire in a giant oil field. He was discovered on his property. 
Yates oil field has now produced over billions of barrels of oil. But before it was discovered, the Yates, whoops, the Yates ranch was actually very poor. They could barely meet their taxes, could barely pay their bills, and barely get by to just keep the ranch up. But all the while, this person, this Mr. Yates, he was richer than he thought he was. I think a lot of us, we'd like to be, believe that we are richer financially than what we really are sometimes. But I've come to tell you tonight, if you are a child of God, you are richer than you might know. You are richer than what you might think that you are. Now, I believe that within inside of us, there's this living water that flows within us. Jesus talked about it in Scripture. And I believe this living water, I believe and I talk about it often about wells. There's wells, different wells within inside of us that we need to drink from and drink from them often because when we do, we get something from God. Our God is a living God and when I get to the well that God wants me to get to, I can walk away with something that will bless my life because God is in the blessing His children business. Can I have an amen? So, I want to talk to you tonight about the well of encouragement. Is it up there? Okay, very good. The well of encouragement and how that works in our lives. All right, the well of encouragement. Encouragement, moving forward and pressing on has been your series this summer. And I'm sure that all the speakers have just been dynamic like they always are and they do a great job. And what I want to do is I just want to come in and I'm going to pull alongside of them at the end and simply say, don't give up now, as Paul would say. I've got something else for you. This isn't it. This isn't, we haven't reached that yet, so let's just keep pressing on, moving forward, doing what God would have us to do, the well of encouragement. The well of encouragement will bring not only you great blessings in your life, it will bring great blessings in others' lives, which God has called us to do. Oftentimes, we want the blessing, but we don't want to give the blessing. But it doesn't work that way with God. Look at the scripture and go ahead and put the next slide up if you will. I'm going to try to remind you to do that and thank you back there in the sound booth tonight. In Luke chapter 6, it's a verse in which we all know. We've probably memorized it, one of these verses. When we look at this verse, we often look at it as only it's talking about money. But you give to God in three ways, I think. You give time, energy, and money. You can make more money, just get another job. There's plenty of them out there. You can make more money. You can have more energy. You can get an energy drink on the way home if you want to or drink a couple more cups of coffee. You can probably get to generate a little bit more energy. But your time is the most valuable thing you have. And what you have, God has given you a time. And how do I know that? Because he got you up this morning. And you have this moment in time to do something with it. The question is, what is it? And so here in this particular passage is given, it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, will run over into your lap. But then he goes on to say, this is how the formula works in your life. For with the measure you use is the measure in which you will be given. Now everyone needs recognition. The little kids, I saw the little kids playing out there in the hallway. I just love that. I love to go to churches where it's a little noisy with kids. Children are always special. I love it when Sunday mornings at our church when we, they go to Sunshine Express Children's Church and those 60 kids or whatever, they rush out the doors and they're all high-fiving and they're all excited. And I just love that because a quiet church is a dying church. And I love to see those children excited about going to class and learning about Jesus and learning about different things and discovering who God is because our hope is built on that. You know, but they like recognition, we like encouragement, Leonard likes encouragement, I like encouragement, you like encouragement, we all like encouragement. Everybody does. The person that you drive, when you drive through McDonald's this week sometime, you know, the person that just takes your money and says, well, did you get the Big Mac meal? And Yes, ma'am. Well, do you know they need a little encouragement too? Did you ever think about that? Did you ever think about offering them to buy their lunch? Just a little encouragement, what that might mean. Our garbage man, he comes by on, uh, let's see, yeah, he comes on Mondays. And about once a month, I'll meet him at the curb because I know about what time he runs. And you know, it's really easy to look past a garbage man because he's just a garbage man. But I'll hand him a soda because I know what he likes, and I hand him a soda, and he always thanks me. Thank you for thinking of me today, especially when it's 100 degrees outside. Just a little thing. 
Because see, sometimes he doesn't get that. Sometimes it's like, hey, you didn't do my garbage right. The trash is all over the place. You should have stopped and picked it up. Everybody likes encouragement. Do you like encouragement? Give me an amen. You can do better than that. Give me another amen. I'm going to light you up. I like what the little boy said to his father. He said, Dad, let's throw darts. Let's play darts. And his dad said, okay. And the little boy said, I'll throw the darts. And you say, wonderful. (laughs) I want to start by telling you first and foremost that you are not insignificant. I cannot tell you how many people I run into, young people in life, that feel as though their life is over. You go through a pandemic and it's just blah, blah, blah. The economy is just blah, blah, blah. And you go through it and feel like, I'm not even going to be missed. If I don't show up at church, many Christians feel as though they will never be missed. And someone's not here tonight, not where I teach or preach tonight, because someone is feeling that I'm not even missed. Never view your life as though Jesus did nothing for you. Augustine said it best when he said, God loves each one of us as though there was only one of us. Isn't it good to know that God loves me? I want to encourage you tonight to remember that, is that God loves you. That's not just a cliche. That's just not a sign on a marquee. That's not just something you put on a shirt. That God, the God of the universe, loves you. As an individual, he loves you. He loved you so much that he gave it all so that you could have it all. And if you have eternal life with God, you ought to shout hallelujah. And you ought to say, thank you, Lord, every day for what I have. Because what I have in you is all that I need in Jesus Christ. If you've claimed Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know. You've been redeemed. You've been set free. And Romans says, now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's past present and future sins. God says, my blood, my son's blood covers it all. And we should be encouraged by that. Do you know why? It's because I know I've sinned in the past. I know I'm going to sin now. I've probably done something today I shouldn't have done. I probably said something or didn't say something I didn't say. Anybody been there but me? But I also know in the future I'm not perfect. And I also know in the future that I will also sin, not because I choose to, but because it's my nature that's beating within my breast that wants to still get out of me sometimes. When somebody cuts me off and I say, oh, happy birthday. We do those kinds of things, but we must remember that God sent his son and that blood covers our past, present, and future sins. We are the children of the Most High God. Give me an amen. It's important in our life to know that. A couple of weeks ago, I received a phone call. It was a call from my bank, and somebody was trying to steal my my identity. (laughs) You know, and uh, the first thing I thought was they they were gonna they they were just actually trying to get into my account and figure some things out, and um, they were trying to fraudulently take some money out of my account. And I thought first, my first thought, I'm not kidding you, my first thought, Leonard was like, are they gonna be surprised when they get into this account? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then I, but I was thankful because as I went through the, all that, you know, we had to, uh, the, the bank caught it early enough and <clears throat> we didn't have to go through too much. You change your card or some pin numbers and stuff like that and had to prove to them that I wasn't in Montana at Walgreens buying $495 worth of makeup and, uh, and, and, and all that kind of thing. But they caught it early enough. But I want to tell you tonight, I believe that perhaps the worst fraud there is in life the worst fraud that there is in life, as I say, it's, it's, it's this, it's, it's the fraud betraying yourself of who you are in Christ Jesus. You know, many Christians don't become all that God wants them to become because they still feel like they can't do it. My friend, if you are a child of God, God can do remarkable things in your life. And you should expect him to do remarkable things because you are a child of God. God. It's important in our life as well. You, my friend, were created for achievement. Isn't that wonderful? You were created for achievement, to move forward, to press on, as your series has been teaching you. You were made, we were made for that. We were made to achieve in our life. And if you have given your life to Christ, 
the seed of greatness has now been planted in you. I think this summer we've had more baptisms this particular summer than we've had in a lot of summers. I think we're up to 26 now, 26 just in the last maybe four months. So give me that much. And it's pretty amazing to see all these young people and older people that are giving their life to Christ and saying, just, just surrendering it over. But in that moment, what they're doing is they're not only having their sins forgiven, something else is taking place. A seed of greatness has been planted in, within inside of them. These little children that were playing out there, there's a seed of greatness just waiting to come out of them. And when you become a child of God, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 38, you get your sins removed, but then He fills you with the greatness of Himself, which is the Holy Spirit that lives within us. How powerful is that? How awesome is that? How encouraging is that? That God, the God, the creator of the universe, would take time to reside inside the little hillbilly from Eubank, Kentucky. But He does, and that's what God has promised. Great seeds are within us. They're planted there for a reason. I basically will tell you two of them. First is to glorify God in what we do in our lives. Secondly, it's to serve others because that goes right in line with Mark chapter 12, which tells us plainly, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and serve or love others as yourself. It's important that we have that in our lives as well. But know this, seeds must be sown for them to grow. You can put them in your pocket and do nothing with them or you can allow them to be sown. And someone is saying even tonight, you're saying, I don't even know what kind of seeds that I have. Well, if you have the Lord living in you, then you got compassion and you got joy and you have peace and you have kindness. You have these, these ingredients within you now. And all I would say you, that you can do is start sowing those seeds and see what God does with it. You might be amazed at what God can do with what you think you can't do. God is a God that can take your impossible and make it possible. But if you don't plant the seed, you'll never get a harvest. Never. You may be saying, I'm not even sure what kind they are. Then just sow some and find out. Stand at the back door and smile at people when they come in. You need a hug? Give a hug. See what you get back in return. Listen to this little encouragement. I threw this one in there this afternoon. Uh, go ahead and put the next slide. Is this 15, 15? Go ahead. and There you go. Oh, great. I love this translation here, and I give it for a reason. Watch this. He says, I'm no longer calling you servants because servants don't understand what their master is thinking and planning. See, the world doesn't know that. The world out there is just chasing everything that it can. You know that, and I know that. They're chasing everything they can to find joy in their life, find contentment in their life. And so the Lord comes alongside of us and says, hey, I'm no longer doing this. No, I've named you friends. I'm calling you a friend. Why? Because I have let you in on everything that I have heard from the Father. That's encouraging that God has something for us. You see, God doesn't want to keep something from you. God wants to reveal something to you. In your relationship with God, your relationship with Christ, in that relationship, you should be discovering what it is that God wants to reveal for you to do in this segment of your life. I turned 66 just a, lot, uh, a month or so ago, and I'm wondering really what I want to do in life. That sounds strange, doesn't it? I've been, been preaching for 30 years, and in ministry probably 33, I guess, as a youth minister a little while. And, um, you know, at 66, I think about that oftentimes. What do I really want to do? Well, I'm a firm believer you ought to do what you're doing and do it to the excellence that you can. And allow God to move you in a direction that he wants to move you. I have no idea what God's going to do with me the next. I know it's not going to be 30 years. I hope to be home with the Lord by then. But, but in that process, I wonder what it is that God has for me. Does he still want me to preach? Does he still want me to do that? Does he still want me to be at Western Hills? You, you need to understand that those are things that I deal with. And I'm sure there's things that you deal with now that I'm this age, now that I'm ready to retire. Am I ready to retire? Do I retire? Can I afford to retire? Preachers say no, but we can't. We don't really know those things, but we struggle with those things. But I am a firm believer that God is still with me, and I'm going to continue to do what He wants me to do because He has a plan for my life. It's though He's sitting at the table with us simply saying, here's the plan. You keep studying, you keep showing you love me, and I'll show you the plan. Because this is truth. 
He will never leave us nor forsake us. Give me an amen. He's so he's saying, here's the plan, move forward with it. Just keep going, just keep putting one foot in front of the other, and I'll show you the direction to go. I think the brother that was up here praying a few moments ago, I, th- I love the prayer, and I, I think it was something about the journey. We're not on it alone. We're together on this journey. Isn't it good to be on a journey together? Isn't it good to look on this side and then look on this side and see that we are family? We're the family of God. Oh, we all have differences, some tall, some short, like me. Some funny and not, some not so funny. Some funny duddies, right? That's just the way life is. But we're in this family together. And God has blessed us and we know that he's with us. Moving forward and pressing on. I believe that. God wants to let us in on something. And that something is you are special to him. Now know this as I'm moving through this. Okay, whoa. God has allowed in each of us a measure of faith. Go ahead with the next slide, in Romans 12. God has dealt with us a measure of faith. And I love this verse because this is what it's telling me. It's telling me that God gives each person what they need to connect to Him. God gives each person a measure of faith so that if you use that faith, when someone tells you about God... Somewhere along the line, you said, I'm going to connect that faith to a God that says, if I connect to him, he will do something with me, which is, first of all, he will save me from all my sin. So he gives us the measure of faith, and then he tells us down in Ephesians 2, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, there's the faith. See, he gave you what you need to connect to him. He does everything. And the reason why he does everything, he tells you in that Ephesians, he says, because you would boast about it. And the only one I want you to boast about is God. Give me an amen. But then he goes on to say, now you have some good works. You don't do the good works to get in or to stay in. You do the good works to glorify God, the one that got you in. Can I have an amen? It's important that we get this. I don't know why I'm saying it's important tonight, but I guess it's important. What God gives, he requires. Someone needs to hear that as well. And don't forget, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, put up the slide please. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Our good works, it reflects Him to the world that is dark around us. Do I have to remind anybody that the world we live in today is dark? Those of you that are my age and older, doesn't it seem pretty dark to you? Huh? When a man can't describe what a woman is, and a woman can't describe what a woman is, and a man thinks he's a woman, and a woman thinks he's a man, and everybody in the world says, well, I think maybe I'm not sure. What, what, it, tell me it's not dark. It's not only dark, it's evil. Period. The world needs the light. And the darker the world gets, the more we should shine. Because the darker it is, The light's going to show up somewhere, and we're called to be the light of the world, not to be hidden under a basket. We're to be put in the middle of the room in the world in which we live and say, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh unto the Father except through Him. That's what we're called to do. It's about reflecting His goodness, His love, His grace, His kindness, His encouragement to a world that is lost so that another might be saved another might be saved one that's on one that's right on the, right on the edge who is it that you can reach have you set a goal to reach one this year you got a few months left just one don't concentrate on everybody concentrate on one how do you do that first of all you get their name you pray for them every day you pray for them every single day i don't care how ugly they are how ugly they get in life where they've been and how dirty they are pray for that person every single day that the blessing of god would be revealed to their life and then do something good in their life so that they might see the light of Jesus. And then when you do, make sure you give God the glory for it. And when you give God the glory for it, you just let the Spirit take care of the rest. You say, well, I don't know. I, if I did that, what if they don't? But what if they do? Just one. Just one. Just one.
You know, there's an old saying, you can't outgive God. But the thing I love about God, He gives you permission to try. Give, and it'll be given to you. Someone might be saying, I, if I give, won't I have less? The world says yes, but the Christian says no. The beauty of God is the more you turn loose, the more He gives back. It's God's design. It's not mine. It's God's design. And understanding that concept will kick your, 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 this, this, this wanting to be more, moving forward and pressing on. It'll kick it into high gear. When I was a kid growing up, we had an old truck. And, and if it got stuck in, you know, in a field or something, you know what? Dad, dad would holler up or somebody would holler up and say, pull it down and bulldog. Anybody know what bulldog means? Anybody? Anybody? What's it mean? Compound. Okay, well, it means, to me, this is what it means. You get in, in the lowest gear you can so you can get yourself out of this ditch. There's a lot of Christians that live in bulldog world when God wants to take us into high gear. Are you in first gear, second gear, third gear? Is there a fourth gear? Sometimes these cars have five and six gears to them. Which gear are you in? Do you want God to take you a little bit higher? I'm telling you, God wants to take you higher. All you got to do is let him do that in your life and say, here I am, Lord, send me. That's an encouragement for you tonight, hopefully. I know I got to hurry through this. Put up the next slide if you would. This is the same one we had earlier. Again, when I was a kid growing up as a teenager, we lived out in the country in Kentucky, and we had a little farm, not much, and I had some milk cows and some chickens and stuff like that, and I would have to often take the old truck and go down to the feed mill and get some feed. If you've ever been there, you know what I mean, and you grab an old burlap sack and you put it under the chute and you got a little hammer here and you pull down on that and you fill that up. My dad would always say, son, grab those corners. You know why you grab the corners? You grab the corners so you pick it up. Drop it down, pick it up, drop it down. Why? Because it would be pressed down, shaken together. And if you didn't pull that lever in time, guess what would happen? It just overflowed. That's what God's saying here. Do you know what overflow in your life is for? It's not for you. The overflow in your life is not for you because you can't handle it. Because the rich man says, oh, I'm going to just take it easy. And what did God say? It's going to be required of you tonight. The overflow in your life is to give to someone else out of the blessings or the abundance that God has blessed you with. And when you do, guess what? God just grew, opened you up for more room to carry more in your life. Because God cannot lie. He proves himself over and over and over again. I have so many stories in there to tell. One of my favorites is a little boy. Um, a little boy goes to the country store, and this is again back in the old days where I grew up, and the little boy goes in there with his dad, and, and there's you know the Cracker Barrel, and you got this, you got this big, big bowl of jelly beans, and the the store owner said to the little boy, he says, reach in there and get you a handful of those jelly beans. The boy didn't move. He didn't say anything. Not a word. He said, go ahead, son. It's all right. I give you permission. You can have a, have a handful of jelly beans. The boy didn't move. Didn't say a word. Finally, the owner reached in the, the jar himself, pulled out a handful, and the little boy cupped his hands like this and placed it in his hands. And the boy thanked him. Thank you, sir. We appreciate that so much. And they went on their way. A little while later, the father asked the son, Son, why didn't you Why didn't you take a handful for yourself? And his answer was quite simple. His hands were much bigger than mine. <laughs> I want to remind us tonight that God's hands are much bigger than ours. He has much larger hands than we do. We just need to learn that and trust that in all that we do to give. We are to study. Go ahead with the next one. Next slide. I'm going to finish up right here because I've, I've come to tell you this tonight as I get ready to close out in just a minute. I want to tell you once again that your life makes a difference. If you're a child of God, I want you to know that your life makes a difference. But I also want to remind all of us that it's supposed to. Did you catch that? On Judgment Day, God won't ask me why I wasn't more like Leonard. 
Well, I wasn't like Elijah or Elijah or Paul or Barnabas or whoever. He's going to ask me, why wasn't I more like Harley Davidson that he called me to be? God wants you to be all the you that he's called you to be. Do you ever play this game? And I've got to get to this because it's going to set the stage for this. Do you ever play this game? When I was a kid growing up, we were poor, but we played find a thimble. Anybody know about that? I'm, I'm just telling my age tonight, right? Find a thimble. You go on a rainy day with kids, we play inside, and you go to the sewing machine, pull out a thimble, and you'd hide it. And when you hit it, what would happen is that you would, um, uh, the, the, the clues were this. Oh, you're cold. You're cold. Oh, you're freezing. Oh, you're an iceberg. That means you, you're, you're a long way from it. Or you're hot, you're warmer. Oh, you're getting warm. Oh, you're about to burn. You're about to bust into flames. Meant you were really close to it. What I discovered about that particular game, the problem I had most of the time when I couldn't find it was this. I was looking too far out there what was normally close by. And I think that's the way we are. Don't look too far out there for what God has in here. You know what God wants you to do and be. And I thank you for being it. I'm going to read the message translation. Go ahead. This should be uh, Philippians 2. I hope it's there on the board for you, the screen. This is the message translation. I hope that doesn't hurt anyone's feelings that I used the message, but I thought it was good. If you've gotten anything out of all of the following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being a community of spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, and do me a favor, agree with each other, love each other, be deep-spirited friends, don't push your way to the front, don't sweet-talk your way to the top, put yourself aside, help others, get ahead, don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage, forget yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. What that simply tells me is encouragement. Put the last slide up. I know Paul wrote these words, Paul penned these words to the church of Philippi, but I extend them to you tonight. And that is what I've seen in you in the past 30 years that I've been coming here. I've known some of you brothers and sisters for 30 years now. I've witnessed beautiful people, you. I've witnessed beautiful people serving others, reaching out with love and compassion and expressing your joy and patience and concern with kindness. And most of all, I've seen a Christ-like attitude in you. Chisholm Trail. Throughout those years, seeds have been sown. And my prayer is that they will continually, as you see these children that will come in in a moment, I'm sure, I pray that they will flourish and they will grow to come to know God as you do and you and I do. And that they would become all that God would have them to be. Your tanks may be feel empty at times. I know mine feels that way. But God's promises are true. And when we give what we have, God always releases more into our lives. And trust me, what he has is much more than what we can give. So moving forward, forward is what God has called you to do. Press on, press on, I say, brothers and sisters. Press on, my friend, for great will be your reward. For the well of encouragement, it's a good place to be. The well of encouragement. What a beautiful well to drink from. And what a refreshing drink to offer others. And I thank you. I thank you, Leonard. I thank the elders of this congregation. I thank you as the members for what you've done, what you're doing, but more importantly, what I believe what God will do in the future at Chisholm Trail. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come. We love you, Lord. You're our God. Who else can we go to? You're it. You're the mighty one. Father, I pray over this church. I pray over the leaders. I pray over the decisions that are made. I pray over Leonard when he speaks from the pulpit that he'll continue to speak with that power of the Spirit behind him, Father, with the love that he's got deep in his heart. I pray for every single member in this congregation. I pray for these little children that run these hallways. I pray for them, Father. I pray for the teachers, and I pray for the cooks, and I pray for the janitors. I pray for those that cut the grass, and I pray for those that clean the windows and the bathrooms. I pray for all of them, Father, to know that they are and making a difference. And for every person that walks through that door that is a visitor, may they feel your presence first, and then the love of brothers and sisters in Christ 
just trying to reach out with your love to them. May it be done, may it be done, in the power and the name of Jesus, let it be so. Amen and amen. God bless you and thank you so much for allowing me to come. Leonard. Well, we want to thank Harley for being here tonight and again for uh, the message of, of encouragement to encourage us to, to move forward. And I appreciate Harley and thank you for coming over and being with us this evening. Uh, a few things before uh, we're dismissed. Uh, I hope you've taken uh, one. If you haven't, they're back on the table. Uh, some of the handouts because there's a lot more uh, on the sheet than what we can mention tonight of things that are coming up uh, over the next uh, few weeks, but I do want to highlight uh, a few. Uh, one is to remember this Friday night we're hosting the Duncan Fifth Quarter. Uh, there'll be a couple hundred here or so uh, kids and, and, and need adult help, and Jason's asking uh, for help. If you need any more information, see Jason uh, about that. Uh, we've got life groups coming up. Uh, the sign-up sheets are, are on the table, and we need to begin to, to sign up and, and get ready uh, for those coming up. There's going to be the big kickoff uh, meeting on Sunday evening, the September the 10th, uh, so uh, be sure and remember that. Uh, because, you know, this is the last Wednesday of our summer series means uh, we've got kind of the fall season kicking off with uh, next Wednesday with a new set of adult gr growth group uh, classes uh, available. Uh, th those are on the sheet, but just real quickly so you'll know, uh, we're going to have a, uh, a raising kids and raising boys parenting class that Jeff uh, is going to lead. Uh, Bill Mays is going to be having a, a Bible study, a textual study of the book of Revelation uh, as well. And then there will be a third class. Uh, we're just calling it something uh, like uh, uh, Life Issues uh, Changes. Uh, just a class that will be dealing with uh, various changes we go through as we go through the stages of life. It's just like the Ecclesiastes writer says that there's a season, uh, but, you know, with every season there are changes we have to deal with, things uh, like empty nesters, things like uh, taking care of aging parents or being the sandwich generation where you're not just taking care of aging parents, you also got you know, adult kids and uh, health changes, uh, other things that we deal with. And so that'll be the third uh, adult growth group class uh, we have available. So sure want to encourage you to be here uh, next Wednesday evening as, as those begin. Uh, also, Ladies Bible Study kicks off uh, next Wednesday morning as well on, on the book of, of Hebrews and so, uh, ladies, be sure and make, uh, uh, make plans to be here, if you can, on Wednesday mornings for the ladies' Bible study. Uh, finally, I uh, just want to take time before we go to God in prayer, again, to remember those that uh, are, are grieving and dealing with loss uh, to, uh, to Lana and to Connie. Uh, and their families with, with the loss of uh, Lan and Connie's mom, Wanda Morris. I just remind you, visitations tomorrow night from 5 to 7 at Bells Polk, and then the service is at Bells Polk Friday morning uh, at 10 o'clock. Then also to, to Lane and Shane Anderson and their families and loss of their dad, uh, Don Anderson, uh, there will be a celebration of life for Don uh, in Walters, and that information is there uh, on September 16th. Uh, so uh, we, we need to remember them. Also, Tim Fritz uh, had a sister pass away, uh, and uh, we want to remember uh, Tim and his family as well. My understanding is there's not going to be a public service uh, for his sister, so but do remember uh, these families. 
again, thank you, Harley, for being here. Thank you, each one. Uh, and um, let's just uh, close our time together uh, with a prayer and then hope you'll stay and uh, visit with each other a little bit. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this evening. Thank you for uh, the encouragement that we've received this evening. Uh, we just ask that you bless each one and, and each family here and bless this church family to move forward in the days to come. And Father, we are especially mindful of those families that, that we mentioned that are going through uh, th this time of, of initial grief. And Father, we just ask your blessings on them. And, and Father, for uh, that family of Wanda Morris, we just ask your blessings on them. Uh, Father, we pray for the Anderson family as they deal with the loss of, of Don and also the Fritz family and, and the loss of Tim's sister. And Father, we just pray your comfort on them and pray that as a church family we can reach out and encourage and, and be your arms of comfort to these families. And Father, we just thank you that uh, in this time of, of loss that we also know that there's great hope because of what you've given us in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for loving us and saving us in Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.